So I dutifully sent myself into a trance, as she directed. I walked down the street of the house where my five-year-old self lived. My young self stood on the front porch wearing red shorts and a red gingham shirt appliqued with a sailboat. The big self greeted the little self, hugged her, and said, I love you. I care about you. How are you? If something's wrong, you can tell me. The five-year-old self looked at her skeptically and said, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm very happy, thank you. I think you should come back another time. Now, I thought that was really funny, she goes on to say, but the therapist got really mad and told me I'd done it wrong. <laughs> at which point I said, you're a crackpot, and this is not helping me at all, and I'm not coming back, which also made her very mad. But thinking about it now, I feel rather lucky when I consider what might have happened had I had a weaker mind or a reason to want the hypnosis to produce something. Now this is the therapeutic social context for Mar Martha's recovered memories. As silly as this sounds, in the early to mid-90s, there were many people discovering memories of abuse that never happened, and many people who experienced the real repercussions for these accusations. The accused suffered alienation of their children's affection, embarrassment, and shame when these allegations were made public. Family disintegration occurred, and for some even time in jail for crimes they had never committed. Now let me emphasize here, I'm not attacking people who were really abused. This is, this is a kind of reverse abuse, I think. Had Martha made these claims public 10 years earlier, it would have been a very different scenario that greeted them than the one that played out in 2005 when a decade of scientific evidence has shown these induced memories to be fictions created through hypnosis. The second blessing was that Martha wrote a very bad book. Now don't get me wrong here, Martha is a fine writer. She's witty, clever, and sassy. She knows how to turn a phrase, how to make a reader laugh and cry. In short, she can tell a tale. But here we had a narrative presented as history that was so full of internal and external inconsistencies that readers had a hard time believing her. Now this is quite a stroke of luck because as Todorov has argued, readers implicitly trust a first person narrative. Why should we doubt a first person narrative? But leaving the saints had Mormons, former Mormons, ex-Mormons, non-Mormons, even anti-Mormons scratching their heads in bewilderment. The sheer number of problems with this book caused me to wonder if maybe somewhere in Martha's psyche she actually wanted to get caught for the truth to be revealed. I just don't know why she felt she could get away with this. Her story, even though false, could have been compelling without the inconsistencies, the hyperbole, the distortion. But most readers have come away from this book expressing the feeling that if I can't trust her in the small details, how can I trust her in the big ones? Finally, we were blessed that the negative response to this book came initially from the very place where we might have expected acceptance. Whether this was because of the numerous inconsistencies in her book, or whether because of the status of Hugh Nibley, where in the Mormon community he's revered both for his social criticism as well as his apologetics. But it was a significant departure from past criticism uh, that the criticism originated first with signature book, Sunstone, and Affirmation. Notice, not farms and fair. The first negative response came from Signature's book's uh, marketing director, Tom Kimball, who called the book problematic and most likely heavily, heavily laced fiction. Sunstone's reviewer, Tanya Lyon, gave the book a fair trial. At the end of the first reading, she admitted she was persuaded. But by applying the analytical tools of her trade, pitting her Princeton sociology PhD against Martha's Harvard sociology PhD, <laughs> She came to the conclusion that Martha's case against Mormonism is exaggerated and shallow. The accuracy of her narrative style suspect and her use of hyperbole in such a devastating accusation misplaced. Even affirmation, the gay Mormon alliance took on the book. Stung by the hypocrisy of Martha's homosexual lifestyle in light of her continuing to collect royalties from a book uh, that she wrote that calls homosexuality a compulsive behavior that can be changed and cured, Affirmation posted a news story on their webpage declaring that Martha Beck's credibility as an author is now in question as leaving the saints as being criticized for alleged inaccuracies. 
I've even seen some people on Mormon recovery boards lamenting that any one of them could have written a better book than Martha did. My perception is that leaving the saints has been received favorably by only three groups of people. Those who know nothing about either Mormonism or false memory syndrome, to those who rage, whose rage against the LDS Church has blinded them to the irrational content of this book, and three, those who have been abused and cannot separate Martha's false victimhood from their own very real, very legitimate victimhood. I would also like to clear up a few details that have confused some readers of leading, leaving the saints. First, to make claims is not the same as offering evidence. Allegations are not proof. Martha has claimed a lot of things. She has proven few. To say something happened does not prove it happened. To say one has physical evidence is not to show that evidence. Martha to date has offered no evidence and proved nothing. We are still at the level of a he said, she said. But Martha has given us a lot of evidence with which to judge who is the most reliable witness. Hugh Nibley's footnotes have stood up much better than her shoddy memoir. Second, Martha has changed her story considerably, not only between the time when she first began to recover her memories and when, and when she published the book, but even since the book was published. Back in the 1990s, she was fairly open about her use of hypnosis, self-hypnosis mostly. She tried to convince her sisters and John to try self-hypnosis, and she fully admitted using hypnosis herself. In the book, she makes it sound like these memories just sort of popped out. However, since the book came out, she told a reporter for the New York Times that she did practice hypnosis once under Ms. Finney, but that it did not play a part in her, recovery, her memory recovery. And then on her website, Martha claimed that when her first therapist proposed a hypnosis session, she refused for the very reason that she didn't want her experiences tainted by any suggestive or leading methods. Those are direct quotes. This is only one example of how Martha has had a really tough time keeping her story straight. Third, even though many have recognized that Martha is an unreliable narrator, they still don't recognize that when she reports the words of others, she is equally unreliable. I've interviewed dozens of people Martha quotes in her book, which is a tough thing since none of them have names in her book. And in every single instance, they've said Martha got it wrong. And not just a little wrong. No, she got things glaringly, unrecognizably, completely wrong. So when reading Leaving the Saints, readers should remember that when Martha gives the words of her parents, they are really words invented by Martha. When Martha gives the words of her brothers and sisters, they are really the words invented by Martha. When Martha gives the words of her former BYU colleagues, her bishop, her stake president, they are really the words invented by Martha. And even when Martha gives the words of her ex-husband John, they are really words invented by Martha. To wit, Martha's mother did not admit that the abuse happened and then later deny it, as Martha reports in her book. Martha's brothers and sisters do not believe she was physically abused, as Martha reports in her book, and Martha's father's last words were not, she was my favorite, as Martha has reported to the press. <laughs> now, let me be a little confessional here. I want to emphasize here that I, my response to Martha's book was not something I enjoyed writing. I, did ha I had no desire to smear her or attack her. I had much better things to do. I had my family, my teaching, and a dissertation that I kind of wanted to work on. But I also felt that her allegations needed a response and that as her father's biographer and a family member, I had access to information that others were not privy to. I also admit that I felt somewhat responsible that Martha's book included these allegations since I published them first although in a very different way, in one short sentence in a very long footnote, and with a very different perspective. Now, I struggled with how to, how to handle that in the book for months and months, and my wife can attest to this, and my publisher can attest to this. That chapter sat there for months. I wondered if I should include it. I wondered what the repercussions would be if I did, or if I didn't. 